Uh, today we're going to talk about desegregation. If you think it's a dead topic, uh, we tried this, we failed, uh, you'd be kind of right. Fewer than 200 districts are still under uh, federal desegregation order under the watch of the Department of Justice. Only a handful of school districts are still doing this voluntarily. At the same time, research suggests integrating kids can make a real difference in their outcomes. Increasing residential diversity means that some cities and uh, suburbs have the ability to do this like they didn't before, and there are more schools where integrating kids by race and class is getting a new look. Today we're going to talk about why and how this is happening. Uh, we're going to start out by showing you some visuals of what integration can look like. Uh, we've got maps of the Jefferson County uh, School District, which encompasses Louisville, Kentucky, where they've had a desegregation uh, plan in place for 40 years. Uh, Dina is going to uh, give us a quick explanation of how the system works there, and then she's going to show us or talk about what each of these maps show. And everyone should know to start out, I am from Louisville, Kentucky, and this is actually a map of my school uh, career. So we're going to be looking at all the elementary schools and high schools I went to as a kid. So. Go ahead, Dina. Great. So just a quick overview of our um, student assignment plan. Back after the PICS case, our board took that as an opportunity to really broaden the definition of diversity. So we moved from a race-based plan to a geographical plan based on multiple criteria looking at diversity. So we look at diversity in terms of socioeconomic status. Um, by that, we measure uh, median household income, we look at adult educational attainment, and we also look at race. And so we have um, broadly categorized the district into three areas that we creatively call category one, two, and three. Um, so category one tends to be those areas of the district that have um, low income, low adult educational attainment, and high minority status. Um, category three areas tend to be more affluent, um, higher educational attainment, and lower minority status. And the goal in general is to uh, make sure that we have school enrollment um, that represent a mix of all three categories. So at the elementary level, we have clusters of schools um, that go um, from different areas of the district and families choose from their first choice to their last choice among um, the clusters of schools, and we look at um, five different factors when we assign students to um, schools, choice and diversity being two of those factors. At the middle and high school level, it works a little bit differently. We have drawn attendance boundaries um, based across the district, and students are automatically assigned to the school that serves their address, but we also have a pretty vibrant and strong magnet program um, system in our district that helps with integration as well. All right, so we're starting out with Dunn, which is where I went to first grade. Um, and you'll look at this map and see kids from all over the city. And then what we're going to see is uh, what would happen if you went to neighborhood schools. Right, so on the um, first map, we had um, red dots and we had green dots. The, those dots each represent students. And so it showed anybody that currently attends Dunn. Um, the map that's currently showing are those students that would attend Dunn under neighborhood schools plan. And basically what it does is um, for this particular school, it's in the East End, it's a more fluent um, area of town. And what it does is it, it cuts the percentage of free and reduced lunch students and the percentage of minority students in half um, if we weren't, went back to a neighborhood schools plan. This is Coleridge Taylor downtown. So Coleridge Taylor is um, a school that's downtown in our West End. It, it tends to be in a more impoverished area. Um, again, those dots represent students from across the district who currently attend Coleridge Taylor. It has a strong uh, Montessori magnet program. Those red dots would be students that would no longer be um, able to attend that school if we went to neighborhood school. And what that shows up on the screen now, those blue dots would be the only the students that would be able to attend that program. Then we have Atherton High School. And Atherton, uh, one last point about Courage Taylor. So what that would do um, in that particular school is 95% of the students would be on free and reduced lunch and, and minority um, under that 
neighborhood school plan. Atherton is a school that's in the middle of the district. It's a high school that has a strong IB program. And you can see, um, even though it pulls um, from a diverse area um, of town, there would be quite a few students that um, would no longer be able to attend that school. And it would draw just strictly from the area closest to the school. All right, thank you. And now I want to talk um, to Jonathan and have him give us some context about Blackstone uh, Valley Prep, which is a charter school. Um, you're a charter network in Rhode Island, um, and you're trying to be intentionally diverse. Can you tell us about who your kids and where they come from? Sure. First off, good afternoon, and thanks for having me here. Um, so Blackstone Valley Prep is a network of charter-free tuition, uh, sorry, tuition-free charter public schools in Rhode Island. And we are set up to it essentially be intentionally diverse by statute. And so the way that our charter was written, we have 25% of our seats reserved for four communities, for each of four communities. Now, we've essentially taken the de facto segregation so common in the Northeast and been like, ha, here, have it back. And so two of those communities happen to be suburban, affluent, and mostly white. And two of the other communities happen to be more urban, uh, low income, and, and comprised of, of people of color. And so just by our lottery system, we end up pulling a, a very diverse student population, both in terms of race, but also in terms of class. In Louisville's case, Dina, you fought all the way to the Supreme Court to keep the integration system intact, and you've just fended off an effort by state lawmakers who tried to return the district to neighborhood schools. That's why we have these lovely maps of what would happen. Um, but why is it worth all the trouble? Um, well, I think the bottom line is our community values diversity and they value choice and they recognize the um, importance of both of those aspects. And so we also realize that um, in Louisville we have a pretty um, highly segregated residential pattern and so schools really provide a powerful opportunity for students to interact and build relationships with other students um, from different backgrounds. And so, um, in fact, when we ask our students, our high school students, and I think that's um, most of the powerful pieces of our story, is we ask our high school stu students, how important is this to you? And overwhelmingly, um, students from all races say, this is important to us. We feel more prepared um, to have a diverse working environment. We feel that we're comfortable having controversial, um, talking about controversial topics around race in our classes. Um, we're comfortable working with students from different backgrounds on different projects. And so listening to our students, that's why we know it's worth it. Jonathan, uh, there's more charters that are trying um, to become intentionally diverse, um, but there's still charters themselves are a tiny sector of uh, the school population. What's the advantage of having charters take on this issue? So I think at one level, it allows us to try, make mistakes, and learn from those mistakes. Um, so at least in our particular case, you know, Rhode Island kind of lent itself to this in the sense that we had these four communities that are tightly packed in the Blackstone Valley corridor. And so it just made sense. You know, I could go on a jog for 15 minutes and run through these four towns, these hyper segregated four towns. And so I, I, I think we can do this on a small scale and start showing people what's possible. And I know we'll get to our academic results in, in a second. Um, but the second part is that we also, again, like I said, have an opportunity to learn from our mistakes. And so, you know, I, I like to tell the story of when I first came to the organization. I taught in a traditional public school in Miami-Dade County, which is where I'm from. And 99.9% .9 of my students were on free or reduced lunch. And so I, I, I just couldn't stand, you know, how unequitable, unfair, and racist our education policies were. And so I left education and I met this executive director who said, I have an intentionally diverse charter school. And I said, my man, how the hell do you convince white people to send their kids to your school? I was like, I got to see this. We'll get to that. Um, so, but, but so I went and I saw it and, and I took the job and I started working there. And then I felt like I had been spikely bamboozled because I was the only teacher of color in all three of our schools at that time. We have six schools now. But so my point is it, it was a learning opportunity for us to say, hey, hey, it's not just about having an intentionally diverse student population. It's how are we preparing our teachers? How are we recruiting our teachers? There were a lot of pieces to learn from, um, and, and we're still in that process. Let's get to the academics. Um, in Louisville's case, uh, the achievement gap between white and black students is still very wide. Um, and 
If integration is working to improve outcomes, why are those gaps still so stark 40 years later? Um, well, I think if, if we knew the answer to the achievement gap, um, we'd all be in a different um, place now. So we, we own it, we acknowledge it, we do still have gaps in Jefferson County. We are seeing progress. Um, all of our student groups have improved um, their performance in reading and math over the last four years. Um, we still, though, recognize that we have gaps with our NAEP scores and our TUDA scores. We're on par with the national average in the large city average. We are seeing some um, growth in our free and reduced lunch and uh, minority students in fourth grade uh, math, for example. We also know that when we look at um, the data a little differently and we look at um, students from Title I areas that go to non-Title I schools, they're outperforming their Title I peers that stay at home. So we are seeing um, some signs of progress, but it's not near enough and not fast enough. And, and we know from a student um, assignment office that just providing integrated schools isn't enough. It's what happens in those walls um, in terms of making sure that everybody has rigorous um, opportunities and building a strong sense of belonging that is the was where the work happens. Right. Same question to you, Jonathan. Blackstone also has some really wide testing gaps between your white and Hispanic kids. Can integration really have an impact on closing those gaps? Absolutely. If you look at the Rhode Island state average scores for every single subgroup, you know, Blackstone Valley Prep has six schools with over 1,600 students, and all of our subgroups outperform the average of their counterparts in the traditional public school system. And so if you ask me both as a teacher, as a parent, as an administrator, if I was going to, you know, I, I was Latino yesterday. It isn't just today. I'm Latino today, and I'm going to be Latino tomorrow. And when I have to send my, my child to school, if I had to send them to a random school, which would likely be hyper-segregated, right now the state average for Latino students in math is 22%. 22% of Latino students in the state of Rhode Island are proficient in math. For Blackstone Valley Prep, it's 49%. Are we on par with the white students? Not yet, but it's, it's part of the work, it's part of the progress, and you know, I live in the community that I teach in. My school is in one of our urban districts, and so my child would go to a hyper-segregated school, and that would be unacceptable to me. I'm not gonna pull an Arnie Duncan and say I send my kid to a public school, but conveniently move to a neighborhood that is a little different than where most of my students would go. Um, and so, do we have some work to do? Absolutely. Um, but are we doing better than our traditional public schools? Yes, we are. Can you talk, Jonathan, about how um, you deal with diversity, making sure it's a constructive uh, experience sort of beyond the academics? What can go wrong and how do you deal with it? Yeah, I, I think my biggest fear is when we end up replicating inequity and inequalities. And so just a, a short anecdote to, to bring that you know, to light was charter schools love systems. It's like, oh, we love systems. We want to be so efficient. Um, and so we had this lunch system at one of our elementary schools, whereby when kids came down in their classroom, you know, if you brought your lunch, you go straight to sit on this side. And then if you buy lunch, then you go through the line and you sit down. Well, they thought that was great because it was so efficient. It was so fast. And it was mostly white female teachers who had come up with this system when we were running it. And I came in one day and other people came in one day they were like, hey, did you notice that um, most of your kids who bring lunch are white and they're sitting on that side of the table? And did you notice that most of your kids who get lunch at school are not white and they're sitting on this side of the table? Oh my God, we had no clue. We never realized that. Like, yeah, that's why we have to, this is an iterative process, right? We, we can't allow this to just, just happen. Um, and so my biggest fear is those types of things taking place. And so I think the important thing is, is making sure that we're constantly analyzing our data, which you've spoken to the academic piece, but we do with behavioral data as well, right? So we have Kickboard, which is a behavior tracking system. And every year we're going to sit down and look, you know, are we taking away more points from our, our, our male students than our female students? Are we taking away more points from our black students than our Latino students? and so on and so forth. Um, and so I think that's a huge piece. Another piece is recognizing our, our teacher flaws and, and deficiencies. And so we have a cultural competence evaluation rubric that we use um, 
to evaluate all our teachers. And this past year, we spent a year of professional development on culturally responsive teaching, working with a group of graduate students from Harvard to develop um, ways to help prepare teachers to be responsive in their classroom. Because when people first hear that, they're like, oh, culturally responsive teaching, I just have to talk about race in every lesson. No, that is not it. There's a lot more to this. Um, and so we, we've been spending a year trying to get to that. Is, um, Dean, is Jefferson County doing more to make sure you sort of talked about what goes on inside schools? Are you making sure that schools are culturally responsive, that diversity is a constructive experience within the schools? Yes. Um, so we also um, are doing a lot of professional development about culturally responsive teaching. We have a um, equity office, and actually our um, chief equity officer, John Marshall, Dr. John Marshall was recognized by Ed Week um, just last week as being a leader to learn from. And so a lot of that work is coming out of his um, shop. But um, some areas that we're working on include um, we have a partnership with the university so that um, teachers that are teaching in our priority schools are able to get um, courses towards um, higher education and, and come out with a, um, a diversity literacy certificate as um, as well. We're also um, tackling our um, what we used to call our code of conduct to look at some, some of those more subjective terms like failure to obey and disruptive behavior and removing those as um, con as, as referrals and, and really talking about what does that mean and so that's work that we're continuing to do. Um, can you talk about, we, we sort of touched on this, um, enticing white and middle class kids who do have options to go to the suburbs, to go to private schools, not to opt in um, to an intentionally diverse charter school. How do you sort of entice those kids without hurting black and Hispanic and poor kids um, in the example of Jefferson County where you have gifted and talented classrooms that are mostly white, for example. Um, you know, there may be examples at Blackstone Valley Prep where you're, you know, the, the lunchroom example. How are you sort of bringing people in without alienating those kids? So um, one way that we do that is, is through our magnet program. So on the screen before you saw Coleridge Taylor and that's a Montessori program and that's a program that's pulling from across the district but it's a program that's available to our, all students so it's not just a matter of enticing um, white or middle class students but it's about what kind of opportunities are we providing for all of our students. We also have um, what we call Project Reach which is um, uh, initiative where we're trying to identify more um, students of color into advanced program and advanced placement courses and provide some intervention or, and some enrichment opportunities to um, to ensure that we're having um, rigorous and challenging curriculum for for all of our students. Jonathan I don't know if you want to respond to that and meanwhile if, if someone has a question in the audience we'll have time for one of those. Sure uh, at BVP we've purposefully avoided using any tracking because of lessons learned in the past. Um, and, and, you know, it, I hate that we have to use the word entice because I almost see it as pandering to white people. Um, but the reality is that we, we've, we started, and, and I think it answers my question to our executive director initially, by not talking about race or class at all. Right. All we did was talk about academic rigor, academic excellence, academic achievement. Um, and it wasn't until three, four years in you know, after we maybe had taken one or two standardized tests, that we really started to embrace our intentional diversity and use that as a pitch. Um, but so I think, you know, part one is academic excellence. You know, we have no tracking, like I said, our, our, our classrooms are heterogeneously set up and all our students are growing. Um, and I think the second piece really is, is community partnerships and word of mouth. Um, and so we have a partnership with Central Falls that is one of our Senate districts that has its own um, public school system. I'm actually um, a city councilman there. But when you as a, as a parent go to sign your kid up for kindergarten, you have all the traditional public schools and all the tuition-free public charter school applications right there. Um, and that's a conversation that you have with, with, with that superintendent, with that community. Um, and if you, you see it as a partnership rather than a competition, it manifests itself differently. Um, I think the other piece, you know, getting to the nitty gritty of it is, is politics, right? We were started by a white mayor of one of the affluent suburban towns who convinced his brother to send his nephew to the school. And that says a lot, right? That sends a message to the community. Word of mouth is very powerful, especially for parents about their, to send their kids to kindergarten. Um, and so I think that played a huge role as well. Do you have any questions? 
Marla Dean, I'm, I'm here, Penn Branch Civic Associ Association Education Chair. I live in Ward 7, and as you know, the research has come out in D.C. Um, is that we're hyper-segregated school system. And as an African-American who lives east of the river, which is considered the not desirable part of the city, who intentionally moved to that area, um, because of my commitment to African Americans and as an educator. I want to ask the question, because we're having this discussion right now. I live in a middle class neighborhood, Penn Branch and um, Hillcrest, where we have half million to million dollar homes. Yet, we can't, and not that I'm saying this is the goal, but white people will not send their kids across the bridge to um, educate with our children. So what we have is this burden on children east of the river coming across the bridge and traveling over an hour to supposedly get a better education. My question is, have you located your schools, your magnet schools, in black communities and brown communities so that white people have to come there instead of black kids always having to go somewhere else to get a good education, supposedly, in quotes? Um, so in Jefferson County, yes, um, that is a strategy that we intentionally do, is place our magnet programs in areas of the um, city where that we can draw um, students from um, different parts into the inner city and um, Brandeis, Coleridge Taylor, um, some of our most successful magnet programs are in areas of the city that um, are um, very low income. All right, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much.